Hello, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. This is our Enable Workshop series of uh, lectures again. Today, in fact, it's not quite a lecture. I think it will be a kind of a dialogue or a discussion. Uh, we have two dis distinguished guests who will be presented better, I think, by my colleague, Maxim Titov, in just a few seconds from now. I just would like to greet everyone here. Thank uh, Oleg and Nadezhda for joining us uh, today. And I hope that we, uh, our students and a couple of our alumni here and a few colleagues who have uh, shown interest and signed up for this event will learn more about the activities of the uh, UN uh, Economic Commission for, for Europe and the activities of supporting the energy transit to, to countries of uh, Eastern, Southeastern Europe and the Caucasus, as I could understand. I don't know much about this, so I'm going to give the floor to, as I said, Maxim and our uh, guests. And I will enjoy together with everyone else the rest of this event. Uh, I'll just let everyone know that it will last more or less about an hour, I think, um, at most an hour and a half in case you guess, uh, you get too excited with questions and discussion points. But that's the maximum of time that we could ask from our guests. Thank you and enjoy. I'm going to turn my camera off now. Thank you very much, Givork. Uh, let's move on for agenda. Uh, so my uh, uh, my task today is to introduce Alek and Nadezhda and to help moderating a, a discussion. And uh, I hope we will have uh, interesting dialogue rather than a lecture tonight. And uh, uh, so to start, uh, Alek Dzubinsky, you are the regional advisor at Sustainable Energy Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe in Geneva since 2018. You provide advisory services, capacity building activities and manage projects in the area of energy upon request of countries with economies in transition. Uh, and previously you were energy efficiency program manager at the same department. Uh, and uh, you, uh, before joining United Nations, you worked as a researcher at universities in Ukraine and in the United States. So you, understand probably well uh, both the topic uh, that we are covering today and the potential interest from our students so in 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 your uh, uh, part uh, i would like you to tell us about the structure of uh, un european commission european economic commission uh, your mission within this department uh, what are you doing in the region as a regional advisor and what is happening under the umbrella of uh, uh, this uh, organization across uh, member countries? Please, Alec, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maxim. It's important to unmute. Uh, good afternoon to most of you or good evening and I guess good morning to some of you who are across the pond uh, in the United States or in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so as Maxim mentioned, I work as the regional advisor for the Sustainable Energy Division at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, the acronym is UNECE, uh, it's shorter. Uh, I would say most of the people around the world know what the United Nations is. However, what the UN Economic Commission for Europe is, that sometimes is not as well known. So I would briefly say a few words about it. It's one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations. <coughs> uh, they cover absolutely all member states and some member states, in fact, are members of more than one uh, regional commission. UNEC was the first one established back in 1947 uh, with the idea of uh, kind of bringing East and West together and uh, making the most of, making it non-political, making it more technical. And um, that's what UNEC, uh, remains even for now. Uh, and even after 1991, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the idea behind UNEC didn't change much, probably with 
some change, meaning that the idea was to bring, to help countries with economies, as they're called, uh, with economies in transition, to in their transition from the centrally planned economies to market economies. Uh, at the UNEC, we have a number of areas of work, number of programs. I represent, as Maxim said, sustainable energy. We also have transport, we have environment, we have trade, we have economic cooperation and integration, forests, housing and land management, or now it's urban development, housing and land management. Um, I might have missed something, but again, the uh, these days it's easy to, uh, to check uh, statistics. I did miss statistics. So, uh, so these are our areas of work. Uh, uh, before um, uh, working in the uh, energy area at UNEC, I started in 2008. Uh, I spent five years at the environment division uh, working on the environmental performance review program. So if you have some questions related to environmental issues, I hope I may be able to respond as well. Uh, and uh, I started my career at the UN back in 1997, long ago, 23 years, uh, and worked in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs and at the Department of Public Information. Um, now, coming back to what the Sustainable Energy Division does and what I do within the Sustainable Energy, uh, I will start with the division overall, and it will actually help to understand my role in it. So the areas of work that we have, uh, they're all mandated by our intergovernmental body, which is the Commission, sorry, the Committee on Sustainable Energy. Uh, under that committee, we have six groups of experts. So if the Committee on Sustainable Energy is, as I said, an intergovernmental body, which means uh, the people who have the authority to vote represent governments, they represent member states. Let me just say, I didn't say that, you may know or not. Uh, there are 56 member states at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, by the name of it, logically, every single country of Europe is a member state of uh, UNEC. Uh, in addition to that, it's the United States, Canada, Turkey, and Israel. Uh, all the countries of the former Soviet Union are member states of the UNEC, and those in Central Asia and in the Caucasus are also member states of our sister commission, ESCA, Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, the Russian Federation is also a member state of both. Uh, now, areas of work for, uh, for the Sustainable Energy Division. Uh, we have groups of experts uh, on energy efficiency, renewable energy, coal mine methane, uh, cleaner electricity production, uh, group of experts on gas and expert group on uh, resource management. Uh, what is, and every group of experts has its program officer who serves as a secretary to that group of expert, experts and also does substantive work on these issues. There are a number of uh, programs that or projects that are directly under the uh, Committee on Sustainable Energy. For example, we had a project it finished last year on pathways to sustainable energy. Um, issues of energy security are also directly under the Committee on Sustainable Energy. Now about my role. As I mentioned, there are 56 member states of which 17 are eligible for technical assistance. We have, and it's not just at UNEC, it's UN-wide. Uh, it's called Re Regular Program on Technical Cooperation that has 
its own budget within the regular UN budget. And it is intended to provide technical assistance to certain countries. In our region, these countries are in Southeastern Europe, essentially all countries of Southeastern Europe that are not member states of the European Union. Uh, so it's Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, uh, North Macedonia and Serbia. Uh, and Kosovo under the Security Council resolution also is eligible for this technical assistance. Then moving further east, uh, three countries of Eastern Europe, uh, Belarus, um, Republic of Moldova and Ukraine. Uh, further east, uh, three countries of the Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia, and five countries of Central Asia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Um, the 17th country is Turkey. So uh, my role as the regional advisor on energy is to provide capacity building and activities and technical assistance to these countries. Uh, in what form, you may ask? Uh, there are several ways. We have what is called field projects. And Nadezhda will later talk to you about one of the projects that we have currently. Uh, I currently manage several. The idea of those projects, they may be country oriented, they may be sub region oriented, they may be region oriented. The idea is that through these projects, we introduce some pilot activities, we provide assistance in policy reforms, we do uh, studies, we do workshops and so on. So this is field projects. There may be, uh, there may be self standing capacity building activities such as training workshops, seminars, trainings, that kind of, uh, those kinds of events. The idea again can be oriented to just one country, can be oriented to several countries, can be directed at the whole region. Uh, so that's, that's all possible. Uh, there are also what is called advisory missions. Uh, what are those? Uh, our clients and our masters are governments of the member states. So uh, the advisory mission may take place if a government sends a request saying that a particular ministry or state agency or state committee uh, needs expertise in a particular area and uh, they would need the regional advisor or on some occasions, mostly it should be the regional advisors, to come to the country and meet with the government officials and discuss issues on a particular subject. Um, as an example, this year overall is not a good example for advisory missions for obvious reasons, because, well, essentially travel was not non-existent. Uh, however, I was able to have one mission to Ukraine um, and uh, I met with representatives of the Ministry of Energy of Ukraine and state agency on energy efficiency and energy savings. Uh, and during those discussions, they have expressed the interest in particular in developing uh, a roadmap on hydrogen economy or hydrogen infrastructure in Ukraine. So as a result of that mission, we looked at what we can provide. We developed a project proposal, an internal project proposal. And right now we are implementing that project uh, that intends to help Ukraine develop this roadmap. And uh, once it is developed, Ukraine is supposed to move further and develop a concept or a strategy uh, so that the uh, use of hydrogen and uh, production of hydrogen becomes something more um, feasible and viable in Ukraine. Uh, 
uh, both for domestic consumption and for exports. Uh, so just giving you an example. So field projects, capacity building workshops and advisory missions are, I would say, the main types of work that I do. Uh, I think I will stop here. You probably will have questions about that. I, it might be useful uh, now that maybe Nadezhda says a few words both about the publication that apparently was of interest to some of your students and also a few words about the project that we are implementing now and she is uh, She's working on it. She is the one who makes it possible. Uh, okay, so before we ask Nadezhda, can I have a right as a moderator to start with one question to you, Oleg? Please, Maxim. As I remember that it was your initiative back in 2010 to launch the International Forum on Energy for Sustainable Development, correct? Correct. Uh, so could you tell us in this situation currently, what is happening with the forum, how it is evolving, and what are plans for, let's say, after lockdown period? Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, the first forum was held uh, back in 2010 in Kazakhstan. Uh, and at that time, it was International Energy Efficiency Forum. It has been developing. Uh, in 2014, at the fifth forum, we had all five regional commissions present. And since then, we always have, it's always a joint forum of the five regional commissions. And from the um, current title of it, you would also guess that it um, evolved beyond energy efficiency and renewable energy. It's now International Forum on Energy for Sustainable Development. Uh, we had uh, 10 fora so far. Uh, the uh, last one, the 10th forum, was in Bangkok last year, uh, organized by our colleagues from, uh, from ESCAP, uh, Economic and Social Commission uh, for Asia and the Pacific. Um, and this year, uh, the host country was, we received an invitation, was supposed to be Georgia. Uh, for obvious reasons, we could not have an in-person forum. And we decided rather than to organize uh, an online event or a series of online events to postpone it to 2021. Mm -hmm. We do not have at the moment a particular date since we still don't know how the situation would evolve. We would like to keep the forum as a physical event, as an in-person event. And for now, uh, the uh, agreement with Georgia is that they will stay as a host uh, for the next year. Uh, so not, I mean, the only thing I can say, this was the first year since 2010 that the forum didn't take place. So that was unfortunate. However, we hope that it will be continued. We plan on that. However, there are things outside of our control. So let's keep our fingers crossed and hope it will happen in 2021. We, yeah. I think a lot of us have a lot of hopes for the next year. Yes, uh, as, as I had the privilege to attend uh, three uh, forums, uh, I think it was in uh, Tunisia. Mm -hmm. that was it was in America. Kazakhstan in 2017, and it was last year in Bangkok as well. So it's uh, every year the agenda is uh, very impressive, and it's a, it's a unique opportunity to meet some very interesting people in person. That's I fully agree. Uh, uh, you are losing uh, some part of the importance of the event if you are switching to online format yeah uh, yeah so I mean, on, online works in a lot of cases but yes. there are things that indeed we miss when Absolutely. we only see each other on screen yeah so. to feel the atmosphere to stay together in line to get a coffee and uh, 
some other nice moments of this uh, interaction with uh, globally known experts in the subject. It's very important. Uh, also, the part which is an equivalent of APRE ski, yeah. the APRE workshops in the evening, they're also yeah, that's why That's why we cross our fingers for Georgia <laughs> next year. OK, so my uh, dear colleagues, uh, are you uh, ready to ask questions, please? Uh, uh, Sergei, Just a suggestion, maybe yes. give Nadezhda an opportunity to speak about the yeah, project sure. and then maybe that will give a okay. more bro a broader picture, I would say. Okay, fine. So Nadezhda Hamrakulova, you are the project officer at the Sustainable Energy Division of UNIC. You are working currently on the project aimed to enhance capacity for countries to develop and implement energy efficiency standards in buildings. Prior to that, you were working in the area of sustainable development for many international organizations, UNEC, UNEP, and FAO. And you uh, also, you hold the executive master's degree in development policies and practices from Graduate Institute of International Development Studies and master's degree in international law from the University of Geneva. So for my uh, junior colleagues, this will give them an idea how to land uh, with a job in uh, the UN uh, institution. I mean, you need to see uh, uh, the, the level of uh, graduation of people. So Nadezhda, please tell us about your work. And uh, as I said already, I was showing this material to our students during my lectures. And even some of our students, they were interested to read about some particular cases from this report. So please, could you tell us a bit uh, what was the purpose and how it is evolving now? Thank you, Maxim. Um, thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, I was working in EC like in two stages, let's say. I was working for one project which was called Financing Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Investments for climate change mitigation. And uh, the publication that you show this part of this project, uh, the end of that project, let's say. And I'm working now back to EC, uh, working for a project on the energy efficiency standards in buildings. So these are the two parts and I will speak from one to the other, let's say. Um, so as you mentioned this publication, I will just briefly say that we looked um, so this publication was, as, let's say, as a result of the project I mentioned, and it looked into the progress in energy efficiency and renewable energy also in 11 countries. So these countries were including Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, North Macedonia, Serbia, Belarus, Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Kazakhstan from, Russian, uh, from Central Asia, yeah, and Russian Federation. In this publication, we particularly looked on what has happened within the period of eight years from 2010 to 18, and how the country is basically involved in the area of energy efficiency and renewable energy, what has been done. And in the end, based on this assessment, um, we concluded on what has to be done for further actions, which is also a part of um, what the other activities of ECE also doing so in order to improve further situation. In this study, we looked at different aspects. We looked at policy and regulatory and institutional reforms in the countries from one side. We also looked at what has been done to improve the capacity of stakeholders what has been done, uh, for example, what kind of best practices were introduced or developed in those countries, which projects were developed and financed also, I mean, what type of financing for energy efficiency and renewable energy is uh, existing in the countries also, and uh, what is being done, what be, was done for raising the general awareness about the necessity for energy efficiency measures and uh, also increase of renewable energy in the countries. So this um, publication started from um, basically asking the primary information from the countries. So we prepared the survey and uh, directed it to the governmental authorities in these 11 countries 
to provide us with information of what is being done or what has been done with the country within each country. Um, after receiving replies from the countries and update information, it was also backed up with desk research. So basically we added the available information um, again up to by the end of 2018 what have been and also added additional examples of what is being done um, in the countries again in the recent times. Um, there were a lot of examples from different countries, um, perhaps we'll not be able to mention it, all of them now, but uh, overall the report or the study concluded that a lot has been done in the, uh, by the countries and in fact over the period of eight years, countries progressed significantly. Some of them started by not having um, even primary legislation or just the, the basic uh, legislation that they had and ended up in eight years by having already the developed regulatory framework. So basically not only the legislative law on energy saving, but they also have prepared the national energy efficiency action plans, their national renewable energy action plans, some of them also developed, um, not all of them, developed very um, in the, uh, intensive um, secondary legislation, but many of them also prepared a lot of um, bylaws that would in, in fact enforce the, the implementation of the main legislation. A lot of countries also progressed in terms of providing the different measures to support energy efficiency and also the measures to and the special programs also schemes to support renewable energy. Well, and I'm sure that you personally, Maxim, know the, the examples in within energy efficiency and renewable energy in Russian Federation that over the last years, the, the let's say the jump of the countries in the progress is very significant and um, a lot has been done. We concluded that there are still some things that has to be improved and they can be improved. It's always um, uh, the work in progress. Let's say in some countries, again, some parts of legislation were missing in some countries that was uh, uh, less involvement of different stakeholders, for example, or some countries didn't have the dedicated energy agencies who would be in charge of um, the implementation of specific policies and programs to support this both area, energy efficiency, renewable energies. Again, the problems with those type of projects are mostly in the fin on financing part, that uh, the financing of energy efficiency and also renewable projects um, has some, let's say, lack of support because there are still special energy efficiency projects in many countries considered to be the projects of high risks and therefore the investments uh, in this area is not going that easy. And the countries told the additional, let's say supportive measures should have, should be introduced and this, the project financing should be more supported um, in, let, I would say in all of the countries that we looked in. So this, the publication again, the publication was done in, prepared in 2019. I must say that uh, by the time when we had already the results of it, I knew that countries already progressed because I had the data available ending up in 2018. And by the time of end of 2019, some countries introduced additional measures, special programs or funds that would already even enhance the situation um, with the uh, development of these areas. Uh, now I'm working for the other project, which uh, you, you um, and Alec also mentioned. This project aims to enhance national capacities to develop and implement energy efficiency standards in buildings. So this is a little bit more, let's say, uh, deeper looking into energy efficiency and how the standards are implemented. We are now currently do started the research or on the gap analysis to identify the gaps between the framework guidelines for energy efficiency standards in buildings and the current standards existing and how they're implemented also in the countries. Here the research is slightly wider. We have also countries from Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Caucasus, also Russian Federation, so it's covering 17 countries. But if 
since um, this is now an ongoing research, but I already can see that um, between the last two years, some areas when we're talking about energy efficiency, that the countries progressed a lot, that uh, more secondary legislation was already um, developed, introduced, and that is helping the countries to, ba to basically implement the specific projects, implement the, the measures, and also to include more stakeholders in this project. So it's not only the governmental authorities, but also the private sector, but it's also um, commercial, yeah, private sector, so commercial uh, part of it. The, the different stakeholders would be more involved in, in this. However, as I said, it's the, the, the process ongoing now. And uh, we presume that it will be still uh, a lot to do. It's not the, the finalized process. I mean, the, the process of working on energy efficiency and implementing the existing standards and improving the standards by themselves, how to make sure that the standards are better and helping more to, to, to increase energy efficiency and that those standards will be implemented correctly also in the countries. So this is brief. And uh, if you have further questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks. Yes, and I think we could start uh, straight from uh, the questions from the audience. I got a question from Anthony, who is asking basically about the procedure of taking some decisions. Uh, let me read the question. How is an idea born and how does that get idea get approved for implementation? For example, how do you choose or assess which type of intervention gets priority over another and in which country, example, Grazia energy efficiency in Uzbekistan or clean transport in Moldova? What are the steps involved? Um, thank you, Anthony. Might, might be good if Anthony could come online just to... Yes, I think see, we can... We see can, in uh, person and maybe say just a few words about your interest, your major, um, that kind of thing would be good to to understand i think we can do it oh here you go hey good afternoon Hi. i'm a, a, an airpo alumni i took the program in 2014 and i currently work for Philips 66 which is a um, u.s oil refiner but um prior to doing my master's in um, st petersburg i um took the master's in Green Management and Sustainability at uh, Bocconi in Milan. Um, although I work in the oil industry, um, I still my heart and I'm a, a CR candidate, which is a program. And um, generally, I wanted to ask. Um, so maybe I can a multiple. Uh, you have a, a selection, a, a decision to make: which projects to implement in which country. Um, how how do how do you decide? Which ones to promote and which ones to? And are they voted by the committee? And then um, how 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 generally how do they go from being an idea to being published on the website as a as a tender or something that is put forward to be actively developed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'll try to answer. Well, the examples that you gave, uh, in fact, there can be no competition, really. Uh, the, uh, the energy efficiency in Uzbekistan uh, belongs to sustainable energy division and clean transport in Moldova belongs to sustainable transport division. So they would go to two different um, regional advisors or two different program officers uh, in UNEC and there will be no competition as far as I know, in, in, with, with some exceptions, but I'll get to that. Uh, in principle, um, uh, what um, the way I work, uh, right now, I'm in the process of developing a work plan for the next year. And I look at what has happened this year or has not happened this year. 
uh, also look at the requests we have received before. And uh, I have certain budget. And based on that budget, I put um, in my work plan specific activities. Uh, that work plan uh, then is approved by our project management unit. Um, sorry, program management unit. Uh, it is still not carved in stone. It can be modified, it can be changed. Sometimes countries who were planning to have an activity or wanted to have an activity, their priorities change. So that kind of comes and goes, but hopefully most of the plan will work. This year was, of course, very different. What we have planned uh, in the beginning of the year or even before that in December last year, um, a lot of it didn't happen. Some of it moved online. Uh, we had uh, two workshops that were planned um, in uh, Yerevan and Belisi on the use of uh, big data um, and geospatial data uh, in um, improving energy efficiency uh, in, in buildings at the city level and the neighborhood level. Uh, so in the end, we uh, did have those workshop, they, the workshops, they were held online. Uh, on one hand, it allowed um, experts and uh, officials from other countries to join uh, they were still focused mostly on, in case of Georgia, on Georgian uh, information and data and were primarily intended for them in case of Armenia, Armenian. Uh, but it also allowed to uh, have people from other countries participate and get some useful information. So as I said, there are certain uh, benefits in having those online. Uh, then um, uh, this is just talking about the uh, budget that I can uh, use directly. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, projects, as I mentioned. And those projects are, again, they are based on the interests of the countries and they are also based on uh, what the interests of donors are. Uh, and um, the project Nadezhda works on right now uh, uh, will look into uh, or is looking into the energy efficiency standards in buildings uh, in uh, the countries of the region. Again, mostly countries of Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia. Uh, the 17th country in this broad group uh, is Russia rather than Turkey. Uh, the main reason is that the Russian Federation is the donor for this project. So in case of the project, we uh, see what the interests of the beneficiary countries are, uh, and they are selected the, in, in some way, uh, and also what the interests of the donor uh, or donors are. Um, uh, again, an example. Uh, which may be appropriate and hopefully that would answer your question to some extent. Uh, uh, under the project, uh, one of the activities is a, a deeper analysis for three countries of the region. So uh, we approached several countries based on the initial interest expressed earlier. Uh, we in fact approached five countries uh, and we received official requests from three of them. Uh, namely Armenia, Moldova, and Kyrgyzstan. So those three countries were selected. If we had received requests from more than three, then we would, I guess, have to choose. Uh, and it is mostly case by case. I cannot say that we follow a certain procedure or we have, as you suggested, a vote by the board. We don't have that. Uh, it is case by case. Uh, I would say uh, I, as a regional advisor, have, as I would say, significant leeway in this deciding. Uh, also, we have the director of the division who uh, may overrule me if necessary, but usually we come to a certain agreement. And, and of course, I always try to consult with my colleagues. Uh, 
I mentioned the areas of work that we have. So I cannot be, as you well understand, I cannot be an expert on everything, on coal mine methane, on energy efficiency, on gas, on hydrogen, on, uh, uh, I don't know, resource management. I have to rely on my colleagues. I try to improve my knowledge, but I will never be as good an expert in resource management as my colleagues are who have been working on that topic for uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, so in case there are some, as you said, competing proposals, usually on the same topic, uh, from several countries to decide which one gets the assistance at this time and which one doesn't, uh, we'll, we'll look into it and we decide. And also our approach is if we have assisted a particular country on some, in some area, and then uh, that same country comes to us again, asking about assistance, but we know that another country also has needs and demands. Uh, we would probably say to the first country, well, for now you have received assistance from us. We have limited resources. We will assist another country and then we'll come back to you when we have additional resources. I don't know if that answers your question, but I tried. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we could move to another question. Uh, Sergey, could we uh, open the video for Denis Kvasniuk to ask his question about Ukraine and Moldova? I think he's without video. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a video camera, Fine. so uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, so I will briefly present myself. I'm My name is Denis Kvesniuk. I'm currently studying in uh, Science and uh, Technology Studies program at European University at St. Petersburg. Uh, I'm a second year master's study, and uh, I am one of the students at uh, Maxim Titov uh, courses on uh, introduction to sustainable energy. And uh, I was interested in in one particular case. Uh, so there are uh, projects of inspecting and building a large, infra uh, a large hydropower infrastructure on Dniester River, uh, however, uh, in uh, on Ukrainian part. However, there are reports which uh, tell us which that such uh, projects of expanding hydropower um, um, infrastructure can affect in uh, uh, can result in um, deficit of water resources in Moldova. And I'm interested, uh, uh, like uh, when different uh, projects uh, are funded, uh, which risks are taken into consideration for not funding such projects? So maybe uh, that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, well, the word project has several meanings. The projects uh, I was talking about is not the kind that you mentioned. We do not deal with infrastructure projects. We simply uh, don't have that kind of money. We are not a, uh, a development bank uh, or an infrastructure financial infrastructure financier. Uh, our projects are more related to policy reforms, sometimes pilot projects, uh, to capacity building, as I mentioned. And they are much smaller in size than uh, building a hydropower station on the Dniester River would involve. Uh, I do have an answer to uh, your question, but maybe it will be very different from what, or maybe not, from what you expect. Uh, what you talk about is uh, environmental impact assessment of any kind of project that uh, happens. There are environmental impact assessments internally, and there are also transboundary effects from big projects. Uh, within the UNEC, under our sister committee on environmental protection, uh, there is a convention ESPO convention, which deals with transboundary effects. Uh, and it deals with environmental impact assessment in transboundary context. 
So uh, in fact, what you are talking about, the issue of building hydropower station on the Dniester by Ukraine is in fact looked at by the compliance committee of the ESPO convention. Uh, the countries still have sovereignty. The convention that I mentioned, it is not, uh, it doesn't have the power or authority of, a sec of the Security Council of the UN. It, it cannot say to the country, don't build the station. However, there is such a thing as peer pressure. And if a country is found uh, as non-compliant with the requirements of the convention, that doesn't look good. So there are certain, this, this is one of the instruments. It's one of the many uh, multilateral environmental agreements who you I'm sure uh, aware of. Uh, and in fact, at the UNEC under the, uh, in the environment area, there are five such uh, conventions dealing with water, air, uh, access to public information and uh, uh, industrial accidents in addition to the ESPO convention that I mentioned before. Uh, in fact, uh, I did mention this project on uh, hydrogen roadmap for Ukraine. So doing this project, uh, three of our sub programs are involved. In addition to energy, it is also transport and environment. Our transport colleagues are looking at the use of hydrogen in transport specifically. So this is just one area of possible hydrogen uses, our colleagues in environment are doing what is called uh, a scoping report for the strategic environmental assessment of the roadmap. Roadmap is not an official document. However, when and if Ukraine decides to develop a concept or a strategy for hydrogen in the country, and it will be adopted by the parliament of Ukraine or by the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine, then it is an obligation for Ukraine under the uh, ESPO convention to do a strategic environmental assessment of that uh, document. And in fact, any law or any strategy has to undergo this strategic environmental assessment. So this is, there are differences. Strategic environmental assessment is on policy documents and legislation. Environment, environmental impact assessment is on a particular project, as you said, meaning infrastructure or something else in that, of that kind, something physical, something technical. Yeah, yeah thank you. you. You pretty much answered my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, for asking your question and uh, Alec for the, the answer. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, while I was listening to uh, Alec, I was thinking that we have a nice uh, representation today, uh, starting from uh, students uh, from Russia. We have our former students from uh, US, uh, Italy, we have a student from Spain, Georgia, uh, we have Armenia. Uh, so it's like a good representation of the, of the regional uh, scope. I was um, uh, thinking while we don't have any other questions from the audience, I would like to ask Nadezhda about your work on uh, energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, from my experience, what I see uh, when I was traveling in those uh, countries of our region, that internal capacity of uh, some of our countries uh, in building a solid uh, policy around energy efficiency is limited, unfortunately. The lack of uh, technical specialists, the lack of financial knowledge, uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, could you probably elaborate a little bit more Be by building capacity what do you understand given like one i know you can take one particular country as an example from balkans or from central asia uh, as you wish mm -hmm. 
because because this uh, language of international institutions this building capacity for you it's easy i mean you understand what it, it's all about but i i'm not sure for our audience today it's it's clear Thank, Thank you, you for this question, Maxim. Indeed, I didn't have a chance to speak a bit about the more details of what we understand yes. by certain aspect of work. Indeed, when we speak about building capacity of stakeholders, and this is what I mean, we, we speak about the possibility for different categories of, uh, um, well, say, starting from end users, from professionals working in energy efficiency area, for representatives of financial services, uh, financial um, sector in principle, what um, what is how they basically what they know what they do and how they implement what they have, if I say it in a simple language. So, for example, for end users in terms of building capacities, there are existing different programs. Uh, there are existing supporting programs for financing support. For example, these. Uh, renovation uh, programs to support renovation of buildings in, in order to include or in the energy efficiency equipment. There are also um, energy management uh, different programs. So these are the, the let's say, um, um, how do I say, the different um, areas depending on which, who, who, uh, who is the category to, to respond. If we are speaking about, for example, the professionals, these are the different activities, trainings, and the manage, um, uh, um, the trainings and the management system and an energy audit. So those who are working in this area, so that they will be more knowledgeable and to implement already the measures. If we are talking about the financial services or representatives of financial sector, private sector, this is the. Uh, different again trainings. This is the technical assistance projects uh, program. Sorry, this is the also including the project financing initiatives or innovative uh, financing, how sometimes they're calling. So it's different type of um, I would say activities that would help in the end for two different stakeholders, being it government, being it representatives of private sector, being it those. Uh, who are in one way or another working in the area of energy efficiency or those who are intent to implement. So the end users, how we go. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Uh, maybe if I can add a couple of things. Yes, please. I just sent, I just sent a couple of links to the training workshops we had before. Uh, one is in fact on high performance buildings that we had in Armenia last year in November. And uh, one full day of that workshop was dedicated to uh, what is called fundamentals and refresher course on the passive house. So what is the passive house? How it is defined? What goes into it? What are the requirements? Uh, certification, that kind of very practical. So. That and people who were at that workshop, they represented, they were from different, uh, I would say areas. They, some were government officials, some were from construction industry, some were from consulting companies. So they got different things from that, but it was quite practical. So people could get information and ideas of if there is an interest in building a passive house in Yerevan or somewhere else in the country. We also had uh, participants from other countries, uh, including those that had experience of, in fact, building a passive house. And they were able to share their experience. So that very practical things. Uh, I also can share, if you wish, uh, or maybe Maxim can share. I just sent some additional information today for the workshops we will have next week. They will be online workshops. Uh, and um, just to see what is meant by this capacity building and they can be very different. They may be more general, I would say. They may be based on a specific study and they may be more concrete, specific on some ideas. The other one that I sent was on this uh, use of big data uh, in uh, uh, 
uh, in energy in buildings, I would say, uh, in the neighborhoods. And you can, uh, that one has on the website, we have not just presentations, we have recording. So if you are interested, you can listen to our, um, uh, our expert, uh, Alisa Freire, uh, who works on those things, who knows this firsthand, who has developed the models and practical applications that are used uh, for that purpose. And they used, uh, it's not just something theoretical. These are things that, for example, Geneva uses in, in developing, uh, further developing its infrastructure, in deciding what kind of uh, energy source needs to be used for a particular commune. Uh, it is used in the Netherlands, it is used in the United Kingdom. So again, something that, um, that can be applicable in other countries. Uh, again, giving information that is not just, oh, this is wonderful, uh, it's a rich country, they can take advantage of it, but we can. No, it's something practical. It's something that any country or any city that wants to apply it can. It's not that expensive. I particularly like, thank you, Oleg, and, and thank you, Nadezhda. I particularly like the part when you mentioned that one country from the region is explaining to another country of some personal experiences, what I call cross-fertilization. We, we observe it in Russia as being a huge country when uh, some uh, Far East Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky can, can tell us about implementing uh, energy service uh, concept to the Leningradska Oblast, uh, to Leningrad region, because they did it first and they uh, had some positive experience. So this it is very useful that you provide such a platform. And with your permission, I will share the information about workshops next week. So if it's available for everybody, students who have time, they could, uh, they could attend. This is a fantastic opportunity. And I would encourage personally, all of you, if you have time to, to follow and uh, to attend these events. Um, uh, another question is coming from Anthony. I wonder, because of the connection, probably it would be better that uh, I read the question or you read it uh, from your screen. How do you manage public-private cooperation? First question. And do you think the knowledge of public administrations has improved over the years? Okay, uh, I'm, further, uh, I'm reading it further. Would you agree uh -huh. that better coordination between yes. local and region, regional government is being able to apply for aid, execute projects autonomously, that is without relying on foreign help uh, is an important objective. Um, wow, <laughs> that, that's a big question. Well, the in terms of uh, skills and knowledge, I my guess is it, it keeps improving. Uh, there is no limit to perfection, but uh, it certainly uh, is improving, and we have seen it. In fact, uh, the information. Yeah, that was analyzed in the publication that Nadezhda talked about. It shows that in the years since our project, that big project started, there have been significant improvements, but they are, there is still room for improvement. Uh, in terms of um, uh, local versus national or regional, uh, that, that is always a big question. It depends uh, on a country. It depends on the way that um, the budget is shared or how the taxes are not just collected, but how they are then distributed, uh, whether sufficient money stay in the, uh, at the local level or everything goes to the national and then goes as disbursements from the uh, national level to the local level, uh, it depends. In terms of relying on the, uh, and in terms of public, uh, public private partnerships, that is a big topic. Uh, we in fact have, uh, have a program, uh, not in the energy division, but in, in, in the trade and economic cooperation division 
that deals with public-private partnerships, specifically in various areas. Uh, and um, as with so many things, there are positive examples and there are negative examples. So I, and since I am not an expert on that, I would not go into it uh, too much. In terms of relying on uh, foreign aid, uh, that has always been a question whether the uh, development assistance helps or hurts. And uh, there is no there is no one answer to that question because uh, sometimes when you, for example, when programs provide for uh, no interest loans or low interest loans that also that, that helps on one hand, but that also crowds out um, the investments or credit that is done as business as usual. One thing is you give it as a pilot, you start some things, uh, but then how do you get to the uh, sustainability of such? Very often projects that we do or other international organizations do, they do something useful, but when the funding stops, very often the project stops. And uh, there is no easy way out of it. The whole idea is to indeed get to the level when, uh, uh, when the local authorities and local experts and stakeholders can take it over, can proceed with their own resources, with their own knowledge and go ahead. And Maxim, who used to work for IFC, probably can tell you more about how things are done with by international financial institutions and what happens when that financing stops. So I will probably stop here. Maybe Nadezhda would like to add something and I'm sure Maxim could share his experience in that. Can I just add a little bit, Maxim? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Indeed, the, the Oleg mentioned the, the publication, and in the publication, and as part of recommendations after the assessment of energy efficiency, renewable energy um, progress, the two recommendations are basically addressing this the questions of Anthony. Uh, one of the recommendations says that the development and implementation of policies, both for related to energy efficiency and renewables, should be coordinated at national, local, and even regional level. And that will, that this basically, when there is no such coordination, it finally leads to an ineffectiveness of the, the, the adoption of the policies. So the, I think this is a very, um, I mean, actual question. And it's also require the, the measure that requires um, um, the, like, like the effectiveness of this measure requires a, a lot of coordination. The another recommendation was also uh, about this different stakeholder involvement. So all relevant stakeholders, including the policymakers, the representative of business community, the financial institution, the representative of civil society and academia, they also should be, um, let's say, involved in the process of the policy formulation and also that it will help um, in the end for the future implementation of this policy, because if it's on, only uh, regulated, let's say, by, from the governmental authorities at the top level, that will not also help in the further in the implementation of uh, those policies. So in fact, it will be, uh, again, ineffective measure. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Nadezhda. I uh, would not probably intervene here with my personal experience because it's not my my day today. I already said what I was supposed to say during my, my lectures. Uh, I would encourage our uh, students and alumni to use the opportunity and ask uh, Alec and Nadezhda maybe a, a last question and then we will let them uh, uh, Maxim, I was yes. told by Paulina, but I don't see any questions or raised hands, to uh, say a few words of uh, work, how do you get to get employed by the yes, UN? Yes, that's an, are, important, an important there are part several, of our discussion. There are ways today. to do it. Uh, for students, in fact, I understand uh, 
they are master level stu students, right? Master degree. Uh, so those who have, uh, who are in the masters or PhD, uh, they can apply for internships. Uh, we like interns. That's a very useful part of it. Right now, Nadezhda works with an intern who is based uh, in Nepal or Bangladesh. I'm not sure. He's but, based uh, in Dubai. In Dubai now. Dubai. <laughs> nice location. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, this year, as I said, <coughs> was unusual. So our interns uh, telecommute from far away. They work online with us. Uh, however, the normal way of doing an internship would be in Geneva. <coughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, uh, and it is unfortunate, the internship program is is not paid. I mean, interns are not paid. Uh, so that limits the, the who can apply, who can, uh, who can come. Uh, but very often uh, students find uh, fellowships or scholarships or some other way to get funds. Uh, and they find this internship experience uh, quite useful. The duration of the internship is from two to six months. Uh, of course, we prefer that the interns come for a longer period. Uh, we would not have a problem with somebody doing an internship with us for three months, but four, five, six months is certainly better. Um, and it also allows the uh, person to get more information, get more experience, and is we hope it is useful for them. We know quite a lot of our uh, alumni, if you wish, who got very good positions, who continued with some uh, research at universities, who got into PhD programs and so on. Uh, as for the uh, employment proper, if I can say, uh, in my personal case, I participated in uh, what was at that time called national competitive examination. Uh, right now, uh, the equivalent of it, uh, which exists, is called Young Professionals Programs. Yeah, young Professionals Program. Uh, it is a competition. Uh, every year, uh, UN announces the eligible countries. Uh, the uh, age of eligibility is you have to be younger than 32. Uh, the countries that are eligible are uh, what is called non-represented or underrepresented member states. Uh, I have to say that the Russian Federation is quite often in, on that list. Uh, and um, uh, also, uh, so that's, that's one of the, and also there is a particular area in which you have to take an exam, uh, do the written test, uh, do the interview and so on. Uh, so I took at that time the exam in economics, uh, but the other areas include administration, environment, uh, sustainable development these days, statistics, uh, law, uh, and others, essentially everything that uh, UN does. Uh, then there are open vacancies. Uh, there is a site uh, which is called uh, Inspira. Uh, uh, this is the site for all uh, open positions within the United Nations Secretariat. I emphasize United Nations Secretariat, uh, which is UN headquarters in New York and all the departments that are based there, regional commissions, uh, ANTAT, which is UN Conference on Trade and Development, uh, UN Environment Program, uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refuge Refugees, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I may have been forgetting something. What I mean is uh, that site is not for job openings, say in UNIDO, or WTO or UNICEF or UNESCO. So there is UN Secretariat and there, is, there are other organizations of the UN system, just to be clear. I can uh, type in the, uh, let me do it right away. Uh, hope I did it right. So this is the site where you can go. 
where you can um, essentially fill out the form called uh, PHP. Nadezhda may remember better than I do what it stands for, but essentially it's a kind of a CV or resume just in the mm -hmm. specific UN format, personal history profile, I recall. Uh, and then you, once you do it, uh, you can apply for positions that uh, you feel you're qualified for. Very often when we receive candidates, we see that some, we, we could get no idea how, how in the world they would decide that they're eligible for that position, but that doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, the idea is you see what the uh, employment opportunity is and you apply. And uh, well, you prepare and you hope for the best. Uh, that's, that's a very straightforward way. Uh, one other thing is, uh, I should probably also mention it. Uh, sometimes we, not just in sustainable energy, but essentially everywhere, we have uh, consultancies and we look for people who can do a particular work, which may be for a period of one month or three months or six months. Uh, it is kind of project oriented, a very specific work, could be a study, could be something of that kind. Uh, and we look for experts uh, in that same uh, Inspira um, uh, website. Uh, there is a part of it that's called consultants roster. And uh, the same personal history profile you prepare, you can put there. And then of course, you somehow need to promote yourself. Uh, so that's, um, I think I'll stay, the, I'll stop here and uh, um, if there are questions on that, I can try to answer as well. Nadezhda. Yes, may I, I see the part Absolutely. of question, would this be an opportunity for the, the, about internship, an opportunity for those who are unable to cover living costs in Switzerland still to have valuable experience to yeah. do Indeed, now um, we face this situation that people cannot travel. And then in, in, as far as I know in UNC, there is now opportunity for remote internship. As, I, as Alec mentioned, we have one intern now who is working with us on the project that I mentioned, who is uh, based in the other country. But I believe that all the divisions within UNECE now are, are basically it's allowed to have remote internship. And it's indeed, it's providing the same experience of work with UEC as uh, it would be the physical internship. It also, of course, it's including you can include it after to in your CV and it is the, the only difference that yes it's not um, physically in Geneva and some uh, maybe let's say fun part of staying in Switzerland is missing but on the other hand the yes the, the expensive costs are also <laughs> reduced so yes indeed it's possible yeah. now Great, fantastic. So uh, with that I think we have one more question from Anatoly, could we switch the microphone so that he is able to? Uh, yeah. I so can. Anatoly, please. So, Anatoly? Uh, yeah, I'm coming here. Uh, so my question, um, well, before let me introduce myself, I am, uh, um, First year student at Enerpol Master's Program. Uh, this year, I'm uh, like one of the three Russian students that were um, chosen for this program this year uh, for the first time. And I have a question um, about uh, punitive measures for non-compliance. Um, since uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, uh, several times, uh, this uh, Basically, right now, um, the the measures for non-compliance with uh, climate change agreements and various goals, uh, they are um, basically name and shame. There is no real action. Uh, and uh, well, you mentioned also uh, the like strategic um, environmental impact assessment and uh, some measures, uh, but basically countries can do whatever they want. Uh, 
um, in this regard in many ways uh, still. So what effort would it take on various levels to introduce more serious measures for non-compliance with these goals? Uh, I know like Paris Agreement was uh, very recent. Uh, well, 2016 is very recent. So I guess uh, this the time for like major you know, summit for a major change, major new agreement is probably too late, maybe in the future. What would it take to introduce serious measures, punitive measures for non-compliance? Uh, thank you, Anatoly. Uh, well, this is not a million dollar question. That's a, probably a trillion dollar question. Uh, the short answer is essentially no. There can be no punitive measures because that would essentially mean that countries would have to give up part of their sovereignty and no country would do it ever. Uh, the only, uh, and you know that well, the only international organ that can impose meaningful sanctions is the, sec is the Security Council. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we know how that works well, quote unquote. Uh, uh, the rest, well, actually, do not underestimate name and shame. In fact, it sometimes works quite well, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. But um, one other thing that I would like, you mentioned the Paris Agreement. And if you look at it and compare, say, to the Kyoto Protocol, it is different. For the Paris Agreement, it was not said that this country needs to reduce its carbon emissions for so much, or this country for that amount. Uh, if you go to the substance of the Paris Agreement, every country has what is called nationally determined contributions, which means a country decided for itself how much it is prepared to do in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Essentially, it's voluntary. And that's how it works in the area of environment, in the area, in the area of energy, there is not much that can be done. You have, on the other hand, uh, you have the energy charter, which was supposed to be something that makes countries do things according to the rules. Where is the energy charter now? Where is the Russian Federation in the energy charter? That probably answers your question. Sorry for being direct and sorry for being a little bit maybe cynical, but it is the fact of the international relations. If somebody somehow could invent the way for to do what you propose, probably you will get a Nobel Prize for that. Okay, well, thank you for the answer for the suggestion for the future. Can I ask a kind of follow-up question, I guess, uh, about, uh, so um, we do see like recently that uh, the uh, like incumbent president uh, of the United States, uh, well, is about to uh, like lose his uh, chance at the second term, but it's almost like credit, like almost determined, like the last, last few steps and a uh, major part uh, played uh, in uh, in this in this uh, unfolding of events was the fact that you know it was pro green and you know this kind of uh, conventional uh, choice for the uh, for the economy for you know sustainability approach. So we, we don't know what's going to happen like in the future with the new president, but still like this green movement in in this scenario it played a very large role. I think, uh, alongside with many other issues like coronavirus and so on. Uh, so in this regard, you can see how, uh, let's say a country that's uh, a decision by the government, uh, well, this here, uh, a country that walked away uh, from the Paris Agreement, that is like total non-compliance, right? Uh, but you could also imagine a case where, you know, uh, in a future agreement, you know, a country, I guess the goal is set by the government, am I right? Like, it is, it is basically said by the current, current government uh, at, at the time. And uh, it, it is obviously uh, responsible for that. So you could say that if a uh, government sets uh, a goal that is not enough in the eyes of the public, uh, 
then it is in danger. That's that's kind of the point of images I'm thinking of. And this is why I ask what kind of social, uh, also social probably effort would it take maybe uh, like so campaigns or, uh, you know, social media or something else. So like another dimension rather than just your kind of government effort. So what other efforts uh, can we do uh, and what effort would it take to kind of create this, uh, you know, uh, a sense of danger for people who are responsible, not only for obviously complying with the goals that he said, but also how high the goals they set. Okay, uh, thank you. That that was a lot of <laughs> information covered and I'm not sure I will respond to all of it. Uh, uh, well, I would not go into the US politics. It's, uh, <laughs> It's a sensitive area. In any case, uh, I would just want to say that, uh, uh, as you mentioned, walking out of the Paris Agreement, it is not non-compliance. Uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, when it was signed and ratified, there are clauses in it that allow a country to, uh, to leave it, which is the case with pretty much almost all agreements or uh, treaties that you have. So this is this is not non-compliance. This is well. This is not good for the uh, for the world. This is not good also for the United States. We think, but uh, but it doesn't fit into the non-compliance category. Uh, we do hope that the new administration will come back to the Paris Agreement. Indeed, uh, to what extent? To what extent? It played a role in the elections. I cannot say. I'm not an American citizen. Uh, I didn't. I couldn't vote for any of the candidates. Uh, I have my own opinions, but I'll keep them to myself. Um, uh, in terms of the pressure on the governments, uh, that indeed may work. This is essentially domestic pressure, and it is important. Uh, it works. I would say differently in um, in countries that have the uh, democratic elections and in countries where you have authoritarian regimes. Uh, in both cases, it may work. It works differently, but it works. But uh, indeed, there are different ways to influence the government. And uh, for that to happen, uh, there needs Sorry, there needs to be indeed a sense of immediate danger. Uh, it is also a question of uh, the priorities for the population of that country. If the situation, economic situation is bad, then maybe the issue of carbon emissions is not high on the minds of the people. Uh, and if uh, the country is reasonably affluent, and it looks at the environment, and it looks at other issues, social issues, um, economic issues, environmental issues in its complexity, uh, then that society may have more leeway, leeway in uh, um, influencing what the government does. Uh, as we can see, for example, in many countries of the European Union. Uh, so that's um, that is a big question. We'll see what happens after the 20th of January next year in the United States, and uh, we probably will see certain changes um, globally as a result of that. Uh, one one thing to mention uh, it's just a joke that I like uh, when a, a, a British person. Uh, sorry, an American person talks to a British person uh, about the party systems in the two countries. And uh, he says to that British guy or well, fellow, uh, well, you have Tories in your country and or conservative party, right? Um, and in the United States, there is the Republican Party they are like Tories in your country. And then in the US, we also have the Democratic Party. And they are like Tories in your country. 
So let's not think of Democratic Party as some kind of labor equivalent or socialist or social democratic. They're not. Uh, Democratic Party and Republican Party are very close in what uh, they pursue. There are differences, of course, uh, probably more differences now with the current leadership than at any time before. But let's not forget uh, the American society is much more conservative than, uh, say, European. Uh, and it's, I think it's important to have in mind. I'll stop here. I don't want to talk about politics. Okay. Uh, Nadezhda, would you like to add something? On this particular, no, I would prefer to be neutral again about yes, the I fully politics understand. In Indeed, I also hope on the personal note and also working in the UN uh, that uh, the United States will not go out of the Paris Climate Agreement finally, but uh, uh, and that the new government will do. But again, I would stay neutral about the political discussion on it. Yeah, we hope they will come back. Yes. Yeah, so it's a very important piece of uh, international legislation, the Paris Climate Agreement, and we all uh, have certain hopes that it will start uh, its implementation and uh, we will see some progress that we really need. So uh, big, big thank you for all of you to attend, uh, to, to agree and to spend your time with us today. Uh, thank you for our students uh, who were active asking your questions. Let's stay in touch. We will be spreading the world about your upcoming events next week and next year. And I wish you success and wish you nice holidays. And uh, thank you very, very much to be with us today. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, thank you Givorg. Thank you for the invitation and for this opportunity. Uh, and I would also like to thank all the participants of this uh, little, I call it workshop. <laughs> and I, I, I only hope that it was useful, at least to some extent, to, to you. Thank you. Thank you also. I like the question, Maxim. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Nadezhda, Alek, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.